Welcome back to Monday Musings, a casual conversation about culture and theology. I'm Justin Neely. And I'm Daniel Chen. We're just a couple guys talking about some stuff. The stuff we have been talking about is counter-catechesis, how to take the messages you're receiving from culture, uh, turn them on their head, and analyze them through a gospel lens. So we hope it's been helpful. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I was just thinking, these these things we talk about, it's easy to think that we need to apply this kind of out there. Uh, but I feel like the first place that even this has been helpful for me to apply is just in my own heart. Do I believe some of these things? You know, I live in this sure, culture. Sure, sure. I've been shaped by this culture. Yep. You know, and where have I mixed this with my understanding with the gospel and it's first counter catechizing ourselves in mm-hmm. some ways. Mm-hmm. So it's been, I, I've, I've enjoyed this series and I think it's been helpful personally for me. Yeah, so. me too. Me too. Uh, so we're going to get into the morality and justice narrative today and kind of talking through that a little bit. But before we do, we're going to begin with our life hack. So what's yours, Daniel? So my life hack, and I should have done this earlier in the summer in May or something, but here we are. I think it'll still be useful. So, you know, do you have it f- flies and fruit flies in your house? Oh, gosh, yes. They're so, so bad. Annoying. So I, in the past, I created these traps. I, I like, made my own. And, uh, but it kind of looks like pee when you're done <laughs> making the trap and I call it like the pee jar. Mm. It's not pee. It Very just nice. Collects, Beautiful. It collects flies, but that doesn't look great either. Right. But I found a way to kill them and, and it not look like pee. And it's using what is called a indoor plug-in fly trap for flies, fruit flies, and moths and gnats and other flying insects. But basically it's like, it's a UV light that attracts bugs. And it's like flypaper on the light. Oh. So you just plug it in. We love it for two reasons. One, at night, it's kind of a warming night light <laughs> that, that's in our kitchen. It kills it like, the insects. And then it attracts the bugs, and they get trapped on the flypaper. Okay. And so you can get, like, raid ones and these other ones. I'm not sure if they work better or not. Um, the one I got, I got an off-brand one, of course, because I just wanted to save money. So, like, an on-brand one is about 35 bucks, and an off-brand one is about 17 18 Okay. So, the one I use is called Safer Home. There's some that the light is, like, huge and will, like, light up basically your whole, oh, wow. like, wall. Uh, I like this because the light is smaller. It looks like a nightlight. Um, you can leave it plugged in throughout the day. It doesn't really work during the day when the sunlight is out, but it works great at night. And uh, I buy the off-brand replacements as well. So, two fly papers is like 10 bucks or you can get 20 for 10 bucks there you go <laughs> so uh but it's been great i have to replace them every couple of weeks there's probably 30 or 40 fruit flies on it before i huh. throw it out and so like right now the one that's currently i probably need to throw it out later this week has two real flies like big flies house okay flies. so that that you get them too yeah it's a little harder um, okay I, I've once saw a fly on there, and then later that day was no longer on there. So mm. it depends on how it sticks. It's better f- definitely for the smaller bugs. Um, but we've probably gotten five or six house flies. Uh, the reason we, we haven't gotten as many is because I, I kill them before I go to bed. Um, yeah, you do. Yeah, we kill them throughout the day. I guess I have a fly swatter life hack too. I think I might have. Said you do. It we we got our fly swatter because of your life hack, and it was life changing. Yeah, yeah, because you. You don't have yeah, to get man. paper to pick. You just pick it up with the flight swatter and throw it away. You basically mm. pierce them. Don't think about it too much, but you you pierce them with that thing. And yeah, you it's just pretty great. Pop them in the trash can. It's great. Yeah. Um. So, but it's been game changing. Like yeah. we have killed so many fruit flies and and house flies with it, and uh, and it's like a nice. It looks nice. You know, yeah. it doesn't look like a pee jar. So sorry, and, Meredith. Yeah. <laughs> for four years of the pee jar. <laughs> She's like, I've been trying to tell you about this. <laughs> Meredith's like, this was my life hack five years ago, but you wouldn't listen to me. <clears throat> my life hack is thanks to Tyler Linderman. So shout out to Tyler. Uh, at least a one-time listener of the month. Should be a multi-time. For if, sure. If not. Um, you know, a, a lot of the like shirts that you would get for like, you know, like our men's retreat uh, t-shirt. You yeah. Know? Like I really like that, that kind of shirt. And I hate buying T-shirts just for T-shirt sake. Mm. Um, they're so expensive; they don't yeah. fit well. So Tyler was like, you, "They sell the next level shirt on Amazon. So the shirt that you would get for your oh, stuff really? to put your logo on it, you can just get a plain version of that shirt, 
and it's ten bucks on Amazon. What? And so if you just wait, are you wearing one? Uh, not right now. Oh, okay. Uh, but if you uh, if you search next level men's premium fitted t shirt, uh, and I'll put the link in the show notes. Um, you can get it. It's like ten bucks. Yeah, and that's nice. It's that's a great. They're, they're really hack. comfortable. Um, so yeah, do that. Yeah, do that. Have you noticed that Amazon has lost more pie? packages recently you know i i do feel there's been some um struggles yeah yeah i feel like i don't know i feel like they've lost they lose like 15 percent of my packages now but to give them credit sometimes when i go to return something they just tell me to keep it yeah and they give me my money back so i'm like you've built up goodwill for me through all these uh you know yeah returns but yeah, they, mine, they, they mine haven't been showing up. They also are starting to. I'm having to start return things to like the Whole Foods store now more than UPS. Why? Uh, they're not giving UPS. They're charging for some of it, and I so interesting. For, so I, I think they are kind of making some of their returns more difficult. Okay, well I'm just gonna say this. You know, say what you want about Jeff Bezos, but. Amazon was running smoothly when Bezos was was in charge. <laughs> so, you know. For what it's worth. For what it's worth. He yeah. should come back so I can get my packages on time. <laughs> come on, Jeff. The hero the world needs, but not that the world deserves. <laughs> so today we're going to deal with the morality and justice narrative. Um, and kind of a, a subset of understanding this. On one... On one way, we, we could call this the, like relativism narrative that you, you should, you know, you, you kind of live however you want. Except right. we're using Tim Keller's book, uh, Preaching, Communicating Faith in an Age of Skepticism. He points out that most modern people would bristle at being called relativist because they would compare how we treat people in this culture to how we've treated people in previous cultures and said, we're so much better than them. And he says it's more about this idea of morality and justice, that we should work for justice, we should live for justice. But he calls it uh, self-authorizing morality, which is we should be moral, we should do these things, we should fight for justice, but at the end of the day, I'm the one who decides what that is. Mm. I'm the one who decides what morality I should subscribe to. Yeah. Or my culture is the ultimate arbiter of, you know, morality and right. justice. So it's important to be moral. It's important to fight for justice. But as I define it. Yes. Is essentially the, the narrative that we're dealing with. And this, I feel like this is subtle because I think there will be a number of people, at least in the South, that will say that that's not what they believe. But functionally, that's how they live. Sure. You know? Yeah, a, that that it's about I I make the final call right on and that's why I, it's funny that's how you get Karens right in the culture who is it what is a Karen <laughs> you, you serious no I'm I'm oh. joking but but why don't you why don't you explain uh, in case explain you explain it in case for, our listener is uh, a Karen our listeners yeah so Karen is a slang term. For someone who is a middle-class white woman who's perceived as entitled or demanding beyond the scope of what is normal. But essentially, a Karen is someone who says, if you're at a restaurant and you say, you have not met my standard, even though I didn't tell you what my standard was. Sure, sure. And so you, give me your manager. Right. You're going to hear about it. Right. Right? Right. Uh, I mean, that's exactly what a Karen is, is that you've decided this is what my standard is. I don't have to tell you what my standard is, but if you fall short, you're going to hear about it. Right. Right? That is exactly <laughs> what this morality, I mean, you know, it's not just in governmental laws that we have this morality problem. It is in everyday life, including when you're at a coffee shop, right? There you go. Yeah, that's that's well said. Uh, so Keller in his book, he, he lists kind of three problems with this kind of self-authorizing morality that is embedded in the morality narrative. And the first is the problem with moral motivation. Why should you care about the poor and do justice? Mm. You know, the, the Christian answer has, has a really clear one that everyone's made in the Imago Day. Yes. And everyone is worthy of love and care and respect. 
the uh, kind of modern, you know, um, idea of justice doesn't really have um, a solid answer there other than it kind of makes me feel good. Yeah. And so it, it really goes kind of back to uh, myself. He, he quotes uh, Luck Ferry that says, uh, it's a common feeling of satisfaction and superiority when we contemplate other societies. So uh, almost this like, I- I'm caring for others as an expression of my superiority to other people and other societies, which is a really strange way to do justice and and care for people. Right. Um, so it's a, a selfish and fragile motivation uh, that he says makes us vulnerable to shifting fashion of media attention. Yeah. Um, okay, so if, if this form of justice or this act is no longer praiseworthy in your culture, does that mean you stop doing it? Right. Um, and, and so if it's really just like societally constructed, uh, why are you doing it? Yeah. Which is a is an issue. And as we're talking about most of these things, something that's good for us to do is we can take what people say and either draw it all the way back from its first conclusion or draw it all the way out to its end conclusion. Usually we can see if something's off. Sure. So, for example, if there is no God, you have to believe in a Darwinistic macroevolution to how we got here. Right. But according to that, why is racism wrong? Right. Right? Right. According to purely if you're a Darwinist, I mean, and Darwin himself was a racist, you you would say, yeah, we have evolved into more superior and less superior beings. Yeah, sure. So why is racism wrong, mm-hmm. for example, mm-hmm. as, as we talk about it? And I think another the why is important, too, because I remember having this conversation, you know, when you're 18 and you get to college and you talk philosophy with your friends because you're solving the world. Well, um, you, you naturally know everything. Yeah. 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 When you're 18... There's nothing you don't know. That's you know? right. And uh, I remember this guy saying, and I could not believe it. I believe it was White Goodman that said, I know you. You know you. You know that I know that you know you. <laughs> <laughs> this guy actually said he did not believe that murder was wrong. He said it was inconvenient. Wow. And you know what? I guess if you come from a— He's a, being consistent. A full secular worldview, it's consistent. But yeah. we all know— that that's wrong. Yeah. Because we're made in the Mago day. Yeah. Right? And so I think this idea of this relativism is what do you do with someone with like him? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? If he is a voting member of this society. Yikes. Yeah. What I mean, what do you do? Mm-hmm. Right? And and I think you start to see, okay, the problem of the the you know, morality justice narrative, the problem of you know, why you need to discover the whys. Right. So so Keller says the first why that the secular modern culture would give is that you know we're we're just more caring we're we're demonstrating we're more liberal in our values than other cultures other people other you know uh societies the second he gives as a possible motivation is just anger over injustice Mm. you know i'm going to do this because i'm angry about x y or z but he points out anger is not a very sustainable motivation or a very Mm. healthy one and so, and, and we do see this a lot in the like modern social justice movements. Yeah, of, in the past three just years. Angry people. Yeah, right. And it, when when you compare it almost to like the civil rights movement led by Dr. King, which they gathered together before their marches, they prayed together. It's a different feeling, right? So anger isn't really a sustainable motivation for why you should do justice. So, and we see the, I mean, even three years later from a lot of the. I feel like 2020 was an angry year. 2020 right? was because of COVID. Yeah. There's like all sorts of stuff that happened oh. in 2020. Yeah. But it, all of that stuff has like kind of flamed out. It, it doesn't right? sustain. It doesn't yeah. sustain. It, it, I mean, you just see, anger. Like yeah. we have lived through how it doesn't sustain. Right. So, so number one problem Keller says about the, kind of the self-authorizing morality uh, justice narrative is the problem of moral motivation. The second, he says, is the problem of moral obligation is, and C.S. Lewis gets into this a lot too, we have a sense of ought. Mm. I ought to do this. I ought not to do that. Where does the sense of ought come from? If, right. if values are totally societally constructed or personally constructed, 
where do we have this idea that I should do something? Um, the, he says the only way to get from moral feelings to moral obligation is to pe- appeal to some moral source or norm of right and wrong outside of both cultures or individuals that validates, invalidates, or revises their competing internal feelings. So we do have this sense of ought that doesn't make sense in the self-authorizing morality narrative. Yeah. Yeah, that idea, I mean, I mean, we would call it what our conscience we sure. Call it the Holy Spirit, you know, it, or, you know, that, that's part of the Imago Dei too, right? Is that because we're made in God's image, we bear the, you, the natural instinct to what is right and wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Th- that's a great question to ask. And, you know, um, yeah. So moral, moral obligation. He, he quotes Nietzsche that, that says basically if all our moral beliefs are, are this isn't, quote, this is him talking through Nietzsche, if all our moral beliefs are really just the product of evolutionary biology, then while some things may feel wrong, they aren't actually truly wrong. That's mm. what Nietzsche would say. Uh, and but I think th- deep down we're like, that doesn't feel right. That, yeah. that phrase doesn't feel right. And because if you actually believe that, right, it feels wrong, but it's not actually wrong then there's no such thing as justice or injustice. Exactly. It's, there's only feelings of justice and injustice, right. but there's not actual justice or in, injustice. Right. Um, and then the third problem, I find this really interesting, is uh, the problem of consistency. Um, and that we believe that values are socially constructed, but not some values. Those are universal. <laughs> so a, a perfect example of this, right, is... Um, you know, th- this kind of um, feeling of relativism, you know, th- you as an individual or a- at least your culture should have the right to decide. And it's wrong for any one culture to tell another culture that they're wrong. Right. You know, okay, so when we pull out of Afghanistan, awful. One of the things that quickly dawns on people is what's going to start happening to women in Afghanistan and just the horrible things the Taliban are going to impose on, on women. Right. So on this one side, we have this, this vision in the West of like women's liberation and women's rights. Then we have this other value that says it's wrong for any culture to impose their cultural values on another. Right. Then we have this reality of what's going to happen in Afghanistan, which is the opposite. And then some of how we value like feminine liber. uh, liberation in the west right so which one's right it is is your bedrock value that no culture can tell one culture what to do does that stand or does your bedrock value of equal rights of women stand right because you can't have both <laughs> uh perfect your, exa- your definition of yeah equal yeah. rights too yeah right because i would th- i'm not i would say from their perspective they were they would say we are maybe they they would believe themselves as, as progressive over there you know what i mean in afghanistan uh, I think they'd say they're following like Sharia law. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like we're doing the right thing. Oh, what sure, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, like well, we're. Right. So they believe yeah. their socially constructed morality, and we believe our socially constructed that's what I'm morality. Yeah, so yeah, which yeah. you know, um, and I, I think that's a great point. Is we like to say, well, there there are no absolutes, but oh yeah, racism is wrong anywhere. There are no absolutes, but I mean sexism. That culture has it wrong. They're backwards. Uh, But you can't have your cake and eat it, too, in in that sense, you know? Um, So it's very inconsistent when you think through kind of the self-authorizing morality. If me and you have different views, this is what, like, the West is doing. I say, if I'm the West and we, me and you have different views, I'm like, you, you don't tell them what to do, but I'll tell them what to do. Exactly. Uh, well said. Well said. So a- out of this, so we've seen kind of three problems with this kind of um, you know, self-authorizing morality, this morality justice narrative. Uh, Keller gives a few ideas on how to engage this narrative. And the first is to identify Christian moral understandings um, from which so many secular moral ideals come from. So like in our society, we largely uh, value 
even in the secular society, care for the marginalized and the oppressed. Well, where did that come from? It, we, we've already talked about it. It didn't come from Darwinianism. Right. It doesn't come from Hinduism. It comes from Christianity. Yeah. It, it comes largely from the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Right. From Jesus's Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. From the Book of James. Like, I mean, th- throughout the Bible is this uh, understanding of care for the poor and marginalized. So helping people understand, okay, you, you believe that's an absolute. I do too. You just don't know where it came from. I, I do know where it comes from. Um, another example is just human rights in general. Uh, largely uh, popular belief set, a core value of modern culture. Where does that come from? It, it comes from the belief in the Imago Dei that we are all created equally in the image of God, worthy of love, respect, care, kindness. Um, it does not come from Darwinianism. It doesn't come from other religions. It comes from Christianity. So I think the more we can help people see what you've done is you've kind of Thomas Jefferson the Bible. Mm. Like you have taken the parts that you want and detached it from its source. Right. And gone off in a different direction without acknowledging where it came from. Yeah. So I think that's a really helpful thing. Yeah. It's like in your subjective morality you're borrowing from the objective morality of the bible yes <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and but you don't know right and i mean i you you've talked about the man what's the term Chron- chronological snobbery yeah Oof. i mean that's what it is right yes. we all think that we have arrived at our conclusions on our own by ourselves because we're so moral and we're smart. so smart R- right yeah but really we need to look back and say how did we come up to this conclusion? Yeah. Right? And even this idea that morality comes from within me stems back hundreds of years of different philosophers saying different things. Sure. Right? Sure. Um, but, yeah, but for sure. If I believe that something is right and something is wrong, an important question is, where did that come from? Yeah. 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 Why do I believe that? Mm-hmm. So that's helpful. The second thing mm-hmm. uh, Keller talks about is, just kind of showing how agape love, the self-giving, self-sacrificial, you know, wholehearted love leads to a life of justice and a life of compassion. And so uh, the, the foundation of a just and compassionate life isn't the shifting sands of, you know, societally constructed morality. It's, it's agape love. And so tying love to justice unlike anger to justice in the kind of more secular yeah. narrative think is helpful. Yeah. And, and I would say this is even a, a call to all believers. Like you want p- to show people why Christian morality is good. Well, let's start with this uh, agape love and, and yeah. live that out in front of others, but also towards others as yeah. well. I, I heard and this is kind of separate, but I've heard uh, Tim Keller also say, when you're <clears throat> evangelizing people, you want to help people wish Christianity was true before they believe it's true. Interesting. And yeah. so he said when you're, when you're working with people, you want them to see how you live, how you treat your spouse, how you care for the poor, what you believe about heaven, and say, I wish I could believe that, but I, it's, just, <clears throat> it's just a little too far-fetched for me. Like, mm. He's like, that's the first step. Yeah. If you get them wanting it, then then there's yeah. the belief afterward. Yeah. But I, I think like presenting a compelling picture of a like loving and just society, I think goes a long way because w- our society is n- pr- neither loving nor just in a lot of uh, th- there's actually probably more justice in our society than there is love. Love is like very much a fading value. Yeah, uh, it's just such an angry society that we live in. So, painting a picture of love, I think, is so helpful. He also talks about the importance of the teaching of the resurrection uh, for Christians. That we believe that, like, there is a day when every sad thing is going to come untrue, and there will be a day in God's new heavens and new earth when every wrong is righted. 
Yeah. And uh, no injustice will ever just stand. It, it'll either be settled at the cross or in hell. Yeah. And so in Miroslav Volf gets into this about th- this belief is actually what enables us toward like nonviolent retaliation, um, not practicing violent retaliation, but practicing nonviolence. If we believe in the end, God will settle everything. Yeah. And so we don't have to. We obviously want to fight for justice here. We don't have to stay up at night thinking this guy got off. I can't believe, you know, this guy got off, this group got off, this country got off. Yeah. And there's just going to be this cosmic injustice left in the universe forever. Yeah. No, it'll all be settled in the end. Yeah. And that enables us to work toward justice, but not kill ourselves while doing it. It's funny. Yeah. You mentioned how everyone's so angry at each other but it comes down to this like people say why you know we live in this like you know relative moralism right and Mm -hmm. people are like why can't we agree and get along i'm like well if everyone is subjectively deciding for themselves right we all have different standards no one has the same standards. yes but if we believe this idea of like the resurrection and all things will come undone and that Morality comes from one place. We can point at that and say yes. we all agree with that. Yes, and it's funny because you will never get unity and lack of anger from the you know relatives of if your moralism comes from a subjective place. Mm-hmm. You can only get it when it comes from an objective place. And as Christians, we can all point to what you just said, the resurrection, yep. and say we can all agree with that. For sure. We can all get behind that. We can all, you know, sing kumbaya and have peace together yeah. because of that. Yep. Right? It, it's coming, you know. One day it's coming. So so at, at each week we've been talking about uh, kind of Keller's uh, paradigm for doing counter-catechesis, which is recognize the narrative, affirm the narrative, subvert the narrative, and fulfill the narrative so how would we recognize this narrative yeah i think we all recognize no matter who you are that there is good and there's bad yep right there's good and there's evil yep so it just depends on how and who is defining it right and then we would affirm you know it's good to fight for justice it's good to live moral lives like this desire within you uh is a good thing yeah yeah, everyone. Yeah, everyone is trying to live whatever they define as an, a moral life. Right. Yeah. And then, how would we subvert it? Yeah, I think kind of twofold here. One, where where does that justice come from? Right. Yeah. So we would say, okay, well, you said everyone has their own truth, their own justice. Well, where does that come from? Mm-hmm. But also if everyone does hold to their own subjective morality, where does that lead? What kind of society does it lead to? Sure. And it's an angry one. It's the one that is actually not unified. That yeah. is leads to destruction. Right. In, right. In, in what we're saying. Yeah. And what about the last one? How do you fulfill it in the gospel? Yeah, pretty much, you know, only in the resurrection uh, and the new heavens and the new earth can all things be um, made right and can all injustices be accounted for and it's only through the objective morality given to us by God that we have utterly failed at, but has been perfectly satisfied by Christ's life, death, and resurrection, that we can have both a sense of justice and a sense of forgiveness and an actual new start. Because one of the things we, we haven't quite analyzed yet in this whole thing is what happens when you fail? Yeah. Yeah. What happens when you fail even your own subjective morality? Yeah. Like, so then what? Um, Christianity is actually the only offer of forgiveness um, from the outside to the inside. And so I, I think that's the only way we can really um, live within this narrative without being totally crushed ourselves or crushing others. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 crush, the crushingness of trying to uphold that subjective morality. I mean, it's just too much. Too much. You know, you mentioned that. It's funny. I I remember someone telling me their problem with Christianity is that they felt like the idea of grace and the idea of the gospel turned them off because it made it feel like now Christians don't have to do the right thing. Sure. And I think the misconception is 
in our belief of the gospel, it's not a hall pass to fail. Yeah. But that that there's good news that there's redemption if you fail. Yeah, that's when good. you fail. That's good. There, there's a huge difference between the two. Well said. Yeah. Well said. Well, uh, thanks for um, joining us uh, today. Next week we'll be back, uh, I think, with our last narrative that we're going to deal with is the history narrative, mm. or as you pointed out, quoting from C.S. Lewis, chronological snobbery of history is pointing toward, you know, this great place of progress, and we finally made it. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to deal with that next week. But until then, thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you then.